Welcome to the CAFC webinar and podcast series. Today's webinar is brought to you by CINSER, the Canadian Network of Child and Youth Rehabilitation. The topic of this webinar is Applying the ICF Framework to Measure Outcomes in Pediatric Rehabilitation. Our moderators today are the co-chairs of the CINSER Outcomes and Benchmarking Committee, Sandy Lippman of the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta, and Shauna Wade from Blurview Kids Rehab in Toronto, Ontario. For more information about this or other webinars, including copies of the PowerPoint presentations and other resources for this webinar, go to the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network at www.ken.cafc.org and search under the Child Development and Rehabilitation category. I would now like to introduce and hand over the presentation to one of our co-chairs, Shauna Wade. Thanks, Doug. Um, As clinicians, administrators, educators, and researchers, we are all challenged every day to demonstrate that our assessments and interventions are making a difference to the children and families that we serve. The intent of this webinar is to enhance our thinking and to begin to integrate the ICF framework around outcome measurements and move beyond the impairment level and to try to capture and report on those important areas of performance that truly have an impact for our children and families overall functioning. Today, we have a terrific panel of speakers to move us along this journey, and I'm very pleased to introduce them to you. Sandy Littman, she has a background in psychology and is the Director of Pediatric Rehabilitation Division at the Glen Rose Hospital in Edmonton. She provides leadership and administrative oversight to the Division of Pediatric Rehab, which includes over 20 programs and services. uh, Sandy is the hospital representative on the National Steering Committee for our group of CENSOR. Joanna Dara has a background in physical therapy and for the past 15 years has been a professor in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Alberta. Her research interests are in the areas of motor development and the rehabilitation management of children with motor disabilities. Kevin Gibson is the co-manager of education, training, and consultation, and manager of the WeSim product line at Uniform Data Systems for Medical Rehabilitation. At UDS, Kevin oversees the development of education and training, presentations, documentation, and teaching tools for UDS subscribers. Kevin regularly presents at workshops and seminars to subscribers and state associations alike. Joelle Robertson uh, is a physiotherapist by background and is the WeSim coordinator at UDS for medical rehabilitation. Joelle answers clinical questions for the WeSim product line, education tools, including but not limited to guides, PowerPoint presentations, case studies, frequently asked questions, and other materials to be used by clinicians or physicians. So we're in good hands today to talk about the WeSim. I am Shauna Wade, and I have a background in occupational therapy, and I'm the Senior Director of the Child Development Program at Blurview Kids Rehab, where we provide services to children with a range of developmental disabilities. And I'm pleased to be able to co-chair with Sandy Lippman the Outcomes and Benchmarking Committee for CENSOR. So today we have a full agenda, and uh, Sandy is going to give a brief introduction to you about CENSOR and some of the goals and objectives of our Outcomes and Benchmarking Subcommittee. We'll have a brief 101 uh, description of the International Classification of Function, Disability, and Health. And then we'll begin to discuss the WeSIM system and its new enhancements and crosswalk that to the ICF-CY framework. And we'll have time for people to have some open discussion and questions. At this point, I will turn it over to my colleague, Sandy, to begin uh, the presentation. Well, thank you, Shauna. Uh, this is uh, Sandy speaking now. Um, Shauna uh, just uh, briefly um, identified that uh, CINSER is a partner of CAPC, uh, and we are a, um, a group that has over 30 child and youth rehabilitation centers and services from across the country uh, represented. represented. Uh, CAFC, the mandate of CAFC is to, and that's Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers, 
is to affect system-wide change in the delivery of health services to children and youth across Canada. Fits very nicely in with our CINSER um, mission and goals. The mission of CINSER is to promote excellence in the provision of rehab services for children, youth, and their families. And we've organized our goals and our work into four main areas. So um, we are working on network development to um, uh, enlarge the group of uh, rehab centers, children's rehab centers across Canada who can work together in this area, uh, advocacy for children and youth with um, uh, disabilities and their families, uh, the development of a minimum data set for outcome indicators, and research and knowledge translation facilitation. The Outcomes and Benchmarking uh, Committee out of CINSER uh, is working on that third goal. And um, the focus has been to promote data sharing and benchmarking with like organizations. And to help with that, to promote the development of a minimum data set of outcome indicators for children's rehab. And this is all for the purpose of improving services nationally for children with disabilities and their families and also with a view to facilitating research in this area and ultimately to improve outcomes for children and youth with disabilities. So as part of the process of developing a consensus on what a minimum data set for children's rehab might look like, we conducted a survey of our member organizations in September of 2009. So the intent of that survey uh, was to first of all get a better handle on who we are uh, what kinds of facilities are, uh, are represented in CINSER and who are the populations that we serve. And then next we wanted to get some idea of what types of indicators our facilities are currently collecting, how consistently are they collected, and how data is reported. And then use that as a bit of a platform for identifying a priority set of national indicators. Uh, when we uh, looked at the level of service that our member organizations are providing, it was uh, split between secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Um, most of the member organizations uh, do secondary work. Um, about 60% also do uh, tertiary, and almost 50% do quaternary. And we provided definitions for them of what these uh, all mean. So the quaternary is kind of provincial, subspecialization, one-of-a-kind services, et cetera. So and interesting that eight of the respondents indicated that they provide all three levels of service delivery. And if you look at our pool of 32 uh, respondents, there's uh, it, most of the um, or, or member organizations do more than one uh, level of service. Uh, we looked at what type of service they provide, and um, most provide outpatient uh, services, so that would be outpatient rehab and child development centers. Uh, uh, only 28% had inpatient services, and 22% were uh, part of a children's acute care uh, hospital center. Uh, when we ask them who they serve, um, uh, the organi member organizations tend to see more clients with primary developmental behavioral um, diagnoses and primary neuromotor neurological conditions. Uh, so that was the highest uh, grouping, and then uh, over half also have sensory impairments and uh, almost 70% musculoskeletal diagnoses. Um, we wanted to know what kind of indicators they're currently um, collecting, and we knew that these would be outcome indicators, process indicators, quality indicators. Most organizations uh, currently collect and report indicators related to the effectiveness of their programs or interventions, and this was really the area we were focused on. And philosophically, <clears throat> we are very interested in looking at outcomes within the ICF framework. So we went on to ask how many uh, of the organizations use ICF framework as a guide to select outcome measures. Uh, 
half of the organizations report that they do, and then we try to um, uh, be a little more specific. 86% of the organizations report that their clinicians uh, use impairment measures, 86% use activity measures, and 58% use participation measures. Uh, now, keeping in mind that this is from an administrative perspective, organizational perspective, um, it could, the answers could be quite different uh, if you looked at from a clinician uh, perspective. And I know that there's some research that's been uh, happening across the country uh, looking at clinicians' use of the ICF, and the numbers are quite different from this. Uh, when we ask them to tell us um, commonly used measures in their organization, uh, gross motor function measures, Canadian occupation performance measure, goal, goal attainment scaling, WEFIM and the PD were the um, uh, top uh, five. And that was one of the, one of the reasons why we uh, asked the, um, our UDS uh, friends to come and talk to us was because the WEFIM is uh, one area where they have been doing uh, work on relating it to the ICF. So following up on the survey, we had a, um, a webinar to further discuss outcome measures, and then our National Advisory Committee met in October uh, in Halifax to try to um, uh, develop further that consensus on a minimum data set. Um, so the decision out of that National Advisory Committee meeting was to develop one common data set with a group of common elements that would go across um, disability groupings, and then to stratify our population to include data elements that are specific to specific populations. Uh, and the two uh, primary patient groupings that uh, we decided we would focus on to begin with, because these are the two groupings that are most represented in our organization, um, would be the physical medicine group and the complex neurodevelopmental group. So common elements across all and then uh, specific elements for those two groupings uh, to start off with. When we talked about what might uh, be included in uh, the common data set elements. Um, the, what you see there is the kind of areas that uh, people thought they wanted to include in that common data set, uh, and you can see that uh, a number of them are reflective of the ICF. So future directions for uh, sensor outcome and benchmarking, uh, we need to do further work on common and population-specific outcome measures that reflect ICF dimensions. Uh, and some of the issues that we need to deal with is to find valid and reliable outcome measures that do address these dimensions, uh, develop a national consensus on these, uh, and then implementation at a national level. So I'd like to now uh, turn this over to Joanna Dara uh, to give us a little primer on the ICF-CY. Okay. Good morning, everybody. My part of the presentation is to give a brief review of the International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health, and suggest some ways that the ICF can be used in pediatric rehabilitation. These are, we are, we're going to, these are the aims of the ICF as described in the textbook, and we're, this morning we're going to focus on the first aim, that is to provide a common language and framework to describe functioning and health. The last three aims refer more to the coding system that comprises the bulk of the ICF book. The next few years are going to be an exciting time in terms of the ICF. The ICF is gaining momentum. In the last five years, over 900 articles have been published about the ICF, compared to less than 300 in the previous five-year period. The literature represents many health disciplines and other service sectors, including education, social work, and even government policy. It is indeed quickly becoming a common language. Most countries have adopted the ICF framework and language in their discussions of health and disability. This diagram from the textbook depicts the framework of the ICF. 
The bi-directional arrows link the four components of the framework, body function and structure, activities and participation, environmental factors, and personal factors. Equal emphasis is given in the model to a person's functional status and the contextual factors. This interactive nature reflects the new paradigm for disability, viewed as the product of the interaction between a person's abilities and the content of the environment. The ICF is now considered to be a biopsychosocial model rather than a medical model of health. It emphasizes health rather than disease, so all of us could be classified using ICF terminology. It's really described as a model of health status rather than a model of disablement. Although sometimes in the literature you'll see it described as a, health, as a model of disablement, the correct terminology is now is actually a model of health status. The arrows used to go in one direction, starting from impairment to disability to handicapped, using the old terms. The new bidirectional arrows remind us that concepts represented by these components can interact each other and that the influence doesn't always have to go from impairment. The ICF Children and Youth version was published in 2007. Discussion regarding the need for a children and youth version started at the beginning of the ICF revisions and the World Health Organization appointed an international committee to work on the ICFCY during these revisions. Some concerns were that the ICF did not consider the effect of maturation or developmental delay. There was also concern that the coding structure did not fully cover childhood functioning, especially in the component of activity and participation. The conceptual framework and definitions used in the two manuals are identical. Codes in the ICFCY have been added to capture developmental changes, especially in the component of activities and participation. For example, the maturation of play can now be coded as solitary play, onlooker play, parallel play, and shared cooperative play, so it shows how play matures and develops over time. Environments specific to children have also been added, such as special education and training service. Interestingly, the committee also took the opportunity to add some extra adult codes, and a footnote in the ICFCY indicates that the two versions will be combined in a future revision. For our purposes today, though, what's important to know is that the philosophical framework of the two versions are identical. So what I'm going to do now is just very quickly review the terms and definitions of the ICF language, and I'm sure that most of you know this already. If you are committed to using the ICF in a clinical context, I would really urge you to buy the textbook. Um, I'm quite familiar with the terminology, and I refer to the textbook more times than uh, very often when I'm trying to decide where to classify things. So body structures are defined as anatomical parts of the body, such as organs, limbs, and, and their components. If there's a problem in body function or structure, it's referred to or defined as an impairment. Body functions represent the physiological functions of the body system. And if there are problems at the component of body function, they're described, again, as an impairment. It's important to note that body functions and structures don't just classify physical body functions and structures. You can see that mental functions and also emotional uh, states or range can be classified under body function and structure. Activity defines execution of a task or an action by an individual. So these are often very functional ADL type of activities. If there's a difficulty, it's described as an activity limitation. Participa participation classifies factors that are, are kind of um, define involvement in a life situation. If there's problems, they're defined or described as a participation restriction. So these are really life roles, and for children, they're things like maintaining friendships, their relationships with their families, going to school, participating in play, and participating in leisure activities. Contextual factors can be external, and described, which are described as environmental, or personal, which are internal influences. Environmental factors can be physical, social, or attitudinal. 
if, there's, if it's a factor that hinders a person, it's described as a barrier. If it's a factor that supports a person, it's described as a facilitator. And it's interesting to note that the ICF cautions against trying to make group barriers or facilitators. You should only look at these in the perspective of an individual person. The example that they give is that uh, sidewalk ramps or sidewalk curbs for a person in a wheelchair are actually a facilitator. They allow them to get around their, their community better. But for a person with a visual impairment, a sidewalk ramp might actually be a barrier because they can't tell when the sidewalk ends and the road starts. The ICF also reminds us that healthcare providers can be social and attitudinal barriers or facilitators. Personal factors are the least well-developed part of the ICF, and there are no codes to classify personal factors. They describe them as internal influences on functioning and disability, and they give examples such as gender, race, age, education, and psychological assets. I would just caution you that if you're going to use the ICF, that you don't automatically lump everything about the person under personal factors, because many personal factors can actually be coded or classified under body function and structure. Things like um, emotional range of state, motivation, temperament, some cognitive abilities, actually, if you look in the index of the book, can be coded under, under uh, body function and structure. So just don't be tempted to put everything about the person under personal factors. I find that students want to do that all the time. So that's a brief overview of the terms. And returning back to the framework, it reminds us of the many interactions that can be hypothesized and evaluated using this framework of the ICF. Remember that there's not one starting point. You don't always have to start at body functions and structures. And that contextual factors get equal billing with a person's health functioning. The World Health Organization actually cautions against assuming a relationship between factors represented by the different components. It's very clear in stating that you need to evaluate that relationship. You also cannot assume the direction of the relationship. So let me give you an example. Muscle strengthening is viewed as a good intervention strategy for children with cerebral palsy. We're interested in it because we think that if by changing muscle strength, which is classified as a body function, we will improve a child's functional abilities or community independence, both which would be classified as a component of activity and participation. The ICF cautions against assuming this directional relationship. You need to evaluate it. And to do that, you have to have outcome measures that represent both components of body function and structure and activities and participation. Also, the bidirectional arrow suggests that perhaps by improving a factor representing activity or participation, you can change body structure or function. So staying with the same example, encouraging bike riding, which would be classified under activity, or involvement in community swimming, which could be classified under participation, a child with cerebral palsy may improve their muscle strength. So understanding the ICF framework has been really exciting for me because it has opened for me a lot of different intervention paths and approaches to, to consider in pediatric rehab. And it provides a template to discuss and map out our different intervention options. It's a way that we can discuss all these different ideas. So moving on about that, with that, let's look at some of the ways that the ICF can be used in pediatric rehabilitation. These suggestions are just a few, and I'm sure that you have others, and that the literature will also suggest others in the next few years. So I suggest that the framework can be used to classify the component level of rehabilitation issues, such as assessment findings, parent concerns, client goals, and outcome measures. And classifying outcome measures by ICF component has become very popular. There's actually a group of researchers in the U.S. working on a project to classify pediatric outcome measures that are used with children with cerebral palsy. It's sometimes challenging if the outcome measure represents more than one component, and the literature suggests some strategies for dealing with this situation, and I'd be happy to discuss them with you if we have time at the end. In a study that we recently completed to review services for children with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy in Alberta, we asked therapists to identify goals for a child described in a scenario. We then classified the goals by the ICF component that was represented. 
And you can see that many therapists had goals that represented the activity component of the ICF, but there were a few goals that actually represented the, the component of participation. So we found that the ICF terminology was a very effective way to categorize goals and to really see where the emphasis of our goals are in pediatric rehabilitation. It's really important to remember that the ICF is a classification system. It's a taxonomy. Just as we classify birds, bees, trees, we're classifying function. And it makes no value judgment about the component level of your goal or your intervention or your assessment. That's our job as clinicians to kind of just try and decide where we want our goals to be. But the ICF yeah, is clearly just a classification system. How do I put it on speakerphone? The ICF also provides a mechanism to evaluate the interaction between goals, interventions, and outcomes. This slide shows a matrix that we designed for the same study that I talked about with goals to evaluate therapist goals and the interventions that they described to meet the goals. So we asked them what their goals were and then how they would meet their goals. So we made this matrix, and you can see that a goal can be at the component of body function but the, uh, the intervention is at the component of activity. And so bike riding to increase muscle strength is an example of this kind of interaction. You can see that there are other relationships that can be identified using ICF language. We found this kind of matrix allowed us to systematically identify and evaluate the assumptions that we made between goals, outcomes, and intervention strategies. And I think it could be really useful clinically. To evaluate these assumed relationships, we need to be able to articulate these relationships and then make sure that we use outcome measures that capture the components represented in the assumed interactions. Again, the ICF framework provides a template to identify and to discuss these relationships. I suggest also that the ICF can also be used as a framework to build a model of practice. The authors of the ICF encouraged the use of the ICF language and framework to develop, to develop our own models. I was recently in Sweden, and healthcare providers there are very interested in developing models of practice to inform their clinical decision making. Let me give you an example. This is a model of clinical decision making that we designed for our physical therapy master's program at the University of Alberta. We intentionally used the language of the ICF to integrate the pieces of our model. So you can see that during an assessment, the students have to identify if their assessment procedure is evaluating factors representing body function and structure, activities and participation, or contextual factors. In the same way, they identify the component of their intervention strategies as representing impairment, activity limitation and participation restriction, or contextual factors. Then, when they choose their outcome measure or look at how they measured it, they also have to determine if their outcome measure represents the component of body function and structure, activity participation, or contextual factors. So it reminds them that if the goal is to change something classified as a component of participation, it's important to have at least one outcome that represents the component of participation. And we have found it very useful. Another important use of the ICF is as a common language. I mentioned at the beginning that different dis disciplines are adopting the ICF framework and language. So it really allows transdisciplinary discussion of large issues. I think an area that has had little development, though, is families' use of the ICF language. Think how powerful it would be for parents to be able to say, this goal represents the component of body function, but our goal is actually more closely aligned to participation. Can you help me see how these two goals get together? Understanding the ICF framework may contribute to empowering parents to be more effective advocates for their children. The ICF, I believe also, as a research, can be used to assist in the dialogue between researchers and clinicians to identify research questions that have clinical relevance, which are really the most important research questions. And so these are some of the issues and uses of the ICF that have been discussed in the literature, and I have no doubt that more will be identified in the near future. It's really an exciting time to be in pediatric rehabilitation. 
Knowledge of the ICF by clinicians is no longer an academic exercise. It is fast becoming an integral part of clinical culture in pediatric rehabilitation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Um, and we'll now move on to uh, Kevin and Joelle to discuss the... All right, thank you, and I want to thank the Center for their participation today and having us participate. This is really an exciting opportunity for us to show um, um, facilities and organizations and clinicians out there a little bit about the WEFIN, but more importantly, how here at UDS, how we've um, mapped or crosswalked our um, tool, the WEFIM uh, instrument, into this ICF and how it can be used in a clinical setting. We're also going to a little bit, talk a little bit about some enhanced um, measures that we have that are out of the IPRC that I'll explain in a little bit. Essentially, what we're going to talk about today is, you know, kind of the WeFIM system, but again, um, more how it's crosswalked and how it can use, be used clinically uh, with the ICF-CY. We also will, as I said, we'll have a case study uh, near the end of the presentation. We'll, we'll share with you a um, particular child that can be used, that has crosswalked to both the WeFIM items, how those mapped out into the actual CF, ICF and CY um, descriptors. And as all, at the end, we'll uh, have some questions and answers uh, later on in the presentation. So a little bit about the WeFIM instrument, um, and I'm going to turn it over to um, Joelle, and she's going to continue the presentation. Um, hi, I'm going to talk a little bit about the WeFIM, and then go into the crosswalking into the I, <clears throat> excuse me the ICF. Um, the WeFIM is a pediatric outcome measurement system that documents functional performance in children. It can be used across various settings, inpatient and outpatient. And in the WeFIM, it establishes a common language that's used by all clinicians, so everybody is familiar with what the child is doing. Um, it's able to illustrate outcomes of care for individual patients, groups, and programs. Some benefits of the WeFIM is that it can document severity of disability or need for assistance of a child, so we're able to determine their functional level. We're able to set goals and monitor changes throughout the WeFIM. Once again, it enhances communication because everybody that is familiar with the WeFIM understands the language. And it can monitor effectiveness and efficiency of the various interventions that are set clinically. Managerial-wise, we can provide real-time reports. So as soon as data is entered in, you can pull up reports to look at for that child or for various groups. You could quantify data for marketing analysis and budgets. You're able to monitor resources. Uh, very nice thing is we can compare the outcomes from your facility to various facilities across the nation. And you're able to track resources or track anything that you decide to put into your database. Um, the conceptual basis for the FIM and thus the WE FIM is that it's based on the theory of the WHO model, the WHO disablement model. As already discussed um, in the previous, previous presentation for the WHO model, you can look at a disease process and thus some of the impairments that can be um, seen with that disease process and then how the disease process can cause some limitations in function or disability. It's within this area that we measure the WEFIM, um, the self-care, the mobility, and the communication measures, and then once again, what, how it affects the child and their participation in the community. Once again, not every impairment will result in a disability, and as stated previously, you will see differences amongst children, and if you impact or make an intervention within the disability, it will affect the impairments and also their function. When we talk about the WEFIM, we talk about the burden of care. The WEFIM measures a child's ability to function, and when they cannot perform an activity of daily living on their own, they need assistance, and we consider this assistance a burden on somebody else. And so we look at what is necessary for the child to complete a specific task. 
area. We have 18 items currently in the WeFEM, and it's a seven-level ordinal scale that rates various functions of the child. We look at children from six months to seven years and older, and we say older because it's children with disabilities, acquired or genetic disabilities. It's discipline-free, so all various clinicians from nursing, speech, physicians, therapists can all use this assessment tool. And we have the minimal data set it stated we have 18 items at this time, and it can be performed in about 15 to 30 minutes and across various settings. Here are the 18 items in the WeFEM. Um, we have the three domains. In self-care, we have the eight items that we look at eating, grooming, bathing, upper body dressing, lower body dressing, toileting, bladder management, and bowel management. Under mobility, we have five items. We look at transfers from chair, wheelchair. We look at transfers from the tub in the shower, transfers to the toilet, and then we look at locomotion both walk, wheelchair, or crawl, and then on the stairs. And then in our last domain of cognitive, we look at five items of comprehension, expression, social interaction, problem solving, and memory. We have specific definitions um, to explain each of these items so that we have a uniform way of measuring what a child is doing. And then same thing with the rating of the various items. I'm going to go through a generic rating and um, explain how the rating levels work. Um, we have the seven level ordinal scale from one to seven, and you start off looking at whether a child needs assistance with any one of the items. And if the child does not need a helper, they would be considered in a form of independence, either a seven or six, depending on if they need any type of device or extra time. And if they require a helper, their highest level of rating would be considered a five. And then their rating would go down from there depending on the amount of assistance they need to complete that task. That's just a brief overview of our WeFEM2 um, system. And with that, we have a companion module, which is the zero to three module that I'm going to briefly talk about. This module is a quick and easy module to perform. It's family-centered. It's a questionnaire that, once again, can be used in various settings, and it's a companion to the WeFEM. Um, you would open up a child's case with the WeFEM and determine from there whether they would require to um, perform a zero to three on this child. There's the three domains, just like in the WeFEM. We have the motor, the cognitive, and the behavioral domains. We have 36 items in the zero to three module. We consider these skills foundational skills to the skills of the WeFEM. We have a three level rating scale that's used. Uh, level three would be that the child usually performs the uh, foundational skill. Level two would be sometimes and level one would be rarely. Once again, this could be done by a questionnaire the parents could fill out or a clinician would be able to complete um, the questionnaire. I'm not going to read through these, but these are the 36 um, items in the zero to three module under motor, cognitive, and behavioral. The next thing that I'm going to present is talking about crosswalking the ICF to um, CY to the WeFEM. I'm just going to quickly go over some things for the ICF. You've already had a great presentation um, about the ICF, but I just want to touch on a few things um, before I lead into the um, commonalities between the ICF, CY, and the WeFEM. So the ICF has the two parts of um, the ICF, the functioning and disability, where you would find the body functions and structures and activities and participations fall and then the contextual factor, factors, which are environmental and personal. The ICF is a systematic process for identifying, documenting, and communicating function of that child. The ICF uses an alphanumeric coding, and you would use a letter to designate the various domains. 
followed by a number for the chapter, and then a secondary and um, tertiary level for looking at the actual activity or whatever is being identified. And then there's a qualifier that appears after the decimal that looks at whether a child has a problem with the activity or whether there's no problem at all. And I just put an example up here of one of the um, descriptors. It would be D5101.4, which would indicate a mild difficulty because of the one appearing after the decimal with an activity of bathing. The 5101 is the activity of bathing the body, and it appears in the domain of activities and participation, which would be category D. I went through and created a relationship between the qualifiers and the WEFEM. And so these are the qualifiers from zero to one looking at no problem with the activity to complete problem or the child's unable to perform that activity. And then on the right side, I put the WEFEM ratings that would go along with that. So if you had an ICF um, descriptor that had a decimal point of 0 0.0 and you were using the WEFEM, the rating in there would be either a level seven or a level six depending on whether the child was able to completely perform the activity without an assistive device or additional time. Once again, and you would have to understand the specific ratings for the WEFIM in order to understand the difference between a level seven and a level six. And then going down the chart, as the child has more assistance or needs more assistance to perform that activity or that task, their rating would go down in the WEFIM. I just wanted to show some of the commonalities between the ICFCY and the WEFM system, both of them being based on the cool model and a description of human function. The ICF looks at children from birth to 18 years, and the WEFM instrument will measure um, a child's function from six months to seven years and older, and we go up to 21 years of age. When looking at the 18 WEFM items, the WEFM items of self-care and mobi mobility primarily crosswalk into the descriptors of activities and participation domain, and the WEFM items of cognitive, um, or the cognitive items crosswalk into body functions and also the activities and participation domain. As stated on the previous slide, when you look at the ICF qualifiers, if there's an intervention and a change in that descriptor, you would also see a change in the qualifier as well as a change in the WEFIM rating. Both the ICF and the WEFIM have national and international comparisons. They both look at a picture of a child's function at a specific point in time, and they both use common language that can be used across disciplines. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through the case study, and then we're going to pull up, um, we created a um, chart or a, a graphing of the various um, ICF codes to the 18 WEFIM items. So this is a case about a child who had a traumatic brain injury and talks about his involvement in his impairment, um, talks about the medications that he's on and where he lived prior to admission. I'm not going to spend the time to read through all the specifics on that, but what I wanted to show is the 18 items from the WEFIM and how we look at the various WEFIM ratings and how you can look at some of the descriptors under the ICFCY. <clears throat> These are just some of the descriptors, and we didn't go through and put down the qualifiers for each of the items or the, each of the descriptors, but you could have a qualifier after that based on the level of function for the child. So our first uh, WEFM item would be eating, and we would look at what the child is able to do in eating. I'm not going to read through each of the 18 items. It would take, um, I think, too much up time up of the presentation, but I'm going to read through eating and then pull up the chart that we have. Um, Matthew's on a modified diet and uses his non-dominant extremity for feeding. A helper provides assistance to scoop each bite and occasionally guides it to Matthew's mouth. Once again, you would have to understand the definition that we use for the WEFIM in order to rate this child. 
But based on the fact that the uh, helper assists with every scoop and guides it to the mouth, the child would be a level two um, or maximal assistance. Can we pull up, Kevin? The yep. I went through and created a um, chart that shows each of the various, oh, this is kind of small, so it's going to be hard to see, each of the various WeFIM items and their definitions and the various ICFCY codes that can be looked at and then thus use descriptors to describe the child's function. So if you were using the WeFIM, you would be able to then look at various ICF descriptors for that child. <clears throat> and I went through for each of the various items and put in the various descriptors um, for each of them with their ICFCY codes. Um, this was also done for the zero to three module, so we also have a um, chart for that as well. So if you just look at this under eating, you can look at ingestion functions um, under body structure and function. You can look at the, under activity participation, you can actually look at eating, indicating a need for eating, carrying out eating, and then also look at drinking. Next to it, I have the ICF descriptions that go along with each of those descriptors. And after that, I have our definition of what we look at under the WeFEM for eating. Um, we're on slide. Yeah. Going back to the case study, um, I went through for each of the various items. I'm going to go through one more of them, and then I'm going to turn over the rest of the presentation to Kevin. Same thing for the, uh, and the next self-care item, which would be grooming. We went through and look at the child and their assistance for obtaining their grooming items and look at the parts of grooming that the child is actually able to do on their own. And we would give this child, once again, a rating of a level two for maximal assistance. And the ICF items or descriptors that were looked at are the items that go along with the child's ability to wash and dry his hands, wash and dry his face, brush his teeth, and brush his hair. And those are the um, activities that are looked at under the ICF. So you can see that there is a way to look at once you are doing the WeFIM specific descriptors for each of the various WeFIM items. Uh, like I said, I went through each of the 18 items for time reasons to give people a chance to answer questions for all the presenters and to give Kevin a chance to present. Um, I'm not going to read through the various 18 items. Um, we did send our slides to Doug so that they are available for you to um, request if you're interested in looking at our slides further. So I'm going to turn over the rest of the presentation to Kevin Gibson, and he's going to talk about our enhancement items. Thank you. Um, for those of you, some of you I think out there are aware of um, our collaboration with a uh, international pediatric rehab collaboration group. Uh, just a quick history, um, probably about two to three years ago, um, UDS and a small uh, pediatric uh, group of facilities in the Pennsylvania area got together and we started formulating some um, activities and tasks to better look at pediatric rehab um, primarily with this small group, um, looking at outcomes between the facilities and them sharing data with UDS and us discussing it. Um, but when we developed this small group, it started to blossom and we got more interest um, nationally. We started adding more people and before we know it, it became an international group where now we have calls and webinars and things with um, over 100 pediatric facilities. Out of that group, we developed certain uh, parameters or certain um, ideas and, and things to better uh, look at pediatric measures and ways that we can enhance the current tool that most of them use, which is the WeFIM. Um, so we developed um, um, some bullet points um, and some things that we're still working on to the future. And one of those, uh, the very important task 
um, was developing an enhancement to the WeFIM tool or different measures to look at. Although we, we believe that WeFIM is a great tool, we know it's not perfect, so we uh, always look to the, to the field of pediatric rehab for ways that we can enhance our current tool. And a lot of times we would get um, feedback on our cognitive items. For those of you that know the WeFIM and Joel talked about it a little bit, there's three cognitive items and two communication items. And, you know, some of the kids and things, it, 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 it's not sensitive enough for those types of areas. So a lot of our enhancements that I'll show you in a minute were related to enhancing more measures or more sensitive measures to the cognitive areas uh, of the current WeFIM. So out of this IPRC, one of the missions was to develop um, some enhanced measures, and we are to a point now where, um, where we have a draft of the enhanced measures, and I'll show those to you. Um, and we are really, at this point, looking for feedback on uh, facilities that like the enhanced measures. We've actually had some internal discussion at UDS of, of looking at maybe the headings or changing a little. So right now, they're still in draft format. Um, so we have initially with the small uh, focus group that we've developed out of the IPRC, we had about 15 measures, but we condensed those and now we're down to about nine and we're pretty set on these nine items. And again, these were developed out of the IPRC and involved in an international uh, focus group. Um, here are uh, the nine items um, and the bold areas are obviously the titles, uh, emotional regulation, and again, these are, these are um, items or measures that the WEFIM currently does not necessarily look at. Emotional regulation is really the child's ability to regulate their emotions and maintain behavioral control. I'm going to pull up the actual um, items in a second so you can see how they're, how, they're, how they're rated. But essentially, we tried to make them still on the seven-point scale and still use some of the language out of the WEFIM that keep them consistent. Um, inhibition of impulsive responses, which is the child's ability to control his behavior and exhibit self-restraint. And some of these, as you probably have noticed, too, are um, geared towards a traumatic brain injury. And a lot of these items, although not exactly, um, were developed with an inpatient rehab facilities mindset, but they, we feel they can be used you know, a lot of the kids, you know, even in the U.S. and uh, in the Canadian area, too, is the kids are moving so fast from the inpatient side to the outpatient side or some other service area. We also feel that a lot of these items, um, as well as the WEFM, can be used in the outpatient arena as well. Uh, safety and dangerous behaviors, the child's ability to behave in a manner that is safe and does not cause danger uh, or harm to himself or others. Uh, Self-monitoring, which is a child's awareness of deficits, and the extent to which a child utilizes compensatory strategies, response time. Um, this was an interesting one to develop, and we had a lot of feedback on this one. And it really is the amount of time and cueing required for a child to respond to greetings, requests, and simple questions. Um, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Another area, and, and we had a um, neuropsychologist in the small focus group and he was really focused on this next item which is new learning. You, know, you can teach a child you know tasks and activities but if he doesn't learn the activity uh, you know what what benefit does it have for him and the WeFIM right now does not look at new learning per se so this is another thing that we felt was a very good measure and something we would, would love to track or rate with children and, and try to measure this. So new learning looks at the child's demonstration of recall or new material after a one hour period of time. This item rates the child's ability to recall a sequence of four elements from a story, task, or activity. So really we looked at um, the child be given a new activity. You know, a lot of kids know certain board games or certain activities, and even if they have a, a TBI or something, they may be able to recall that activity just because it's more in their long-term memory. So when we develop this measure, we're thinking a new activity, something the child has never seen or heard before, and you give them this activity, and then you go back to the activity an hour later and see if they actually have learned that step or learned that activity. Uh, next uh, measure is initiation, which is a child's ability to begin and continue to completion of simple everyday tasks such as eating a meal, dressing, taking turns during a game of brushing teeth. 
Uh, attention and focusing, which is the child's ability to independently focus on, on and complete an activity in a group setting or a busy gym with distractions. Again, this was another one that was an interesting one where, you know, attention and focusing, a child may be able to be in a small um, uh, setting, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, be able to focus and, intention, and, and attend to an activity, but once you get them in a therapy gym or once you get them in a, in a classroom setting, they may not be able to attend or focus, and that may be really impacting their education and everything else that goes along with it. Um, the next one was diet level, which is a child's ability to take in nutrition by mouth. The rating for this item reflects the burden of care for caregivers, um, and this one is a little bit similar to the eating item for those of you familiar with the, the WeFIM items, but it takes into account if a child is getting other kinds of nutritional support, like a G tube or like a PEG tube, but they also are taking in uh, food by mouth. The current WeFIM item would be rated a one no matter what because they're getting external support and somebody is giving an external support. What this item looks at you know, looking at the child's ability to take in nutrition by mouth as well as those other um, forms of nutrition. Um, next slide. Before we go to the Q&A session, I just wanted to show you the um, actual draft of the items. And these are listed or these are posted on our uh, website, udsmr.org for anyone to go and look at them. They're in a draft format. We uh, would love feedback on any of these items, um, especially internationally and, and from the Canadian uh, facilities out there. If you feel that these are beneficial or if you feel um, the wording needs to be changed or if they're confusing, uh, we would love to hear from you. These have gone throughout most of the U.S. facilities uh, that use WeFIM or don't use WeFIM, so we're kind of just looking for any type of feedback you have on those. Um, our plan eventually, probably in a month or two, once we get some approval from an IRB, that we're going to field test these items. And again, if you are interested in doing that, please let Joelle or myself know, and I'll have our contact and pilot the items. We would love to have uh, you know all facilities participate. Again, you don't have to use the, the WeFIM particularly. Um, the plan is, though, if you are become a field testing or pilot um, facility, we would need the WeFIM item rated as well and these new items, but we'll work out those details if you have an interest. We want to make sure these are different than the WeFIM items and then they're really measuring uh, what we want them to measure. And we have a, a very uh, a robust statistical group here that once we get data and look at the items, uh, there's, a, there's a process we go through to developing measures and, and the validity and reliability of measures that we'll have to go through with this as well. Um, so that said, um, that is the end of our presentation. I left our contact information on there if you have specific questions or information for Joelle or I. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, at this point in time, we'd like to open it up to the broader group. And uh, I believe, Doug, you have a protocol for asking questions. Yeah, thanks, Shauna. Uh, because we have so many people, we won't be able to open uh, phone lines for, for sort of verbal back and forth questions. But we do have an, a few questions that have been submitted to the question box. And, and while I'm reading a couple of these, if anyone else has any questions, um, feel free to type them into the question box, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. We may not get to all of them. but uh, So I'll just read off a couple questions. I think the first one came in during uh, Kevin and Joel's presentation. Um, and they, uh, the question was uh, a comment as much as of a question, and it says, I'm concerned about equating the term handicap with participation. Uh, they are not just different dimensions of the same thing. They are different things. But she also qualifies and says she understands the history of the WeFIM in a, in a pre-ICF context. That's really not really a question, but more of a comment. But do you have any, any, any comment back to that, uh, Kevin or Joel? Yeah, Doug, uh, that's a great question. I, we 100% you know, agree with you. Uh, the WHO model back in 1980 used the term handicap, um, and that's where you know, the WeFIM was originally developed based upon that model. 
And in 2001, when the WHO uh, changed the language, they went to participation. But we're, you know, we 100% we agree we would use the word activity and participation, and we would not use those, those um, definitions or those terms that the WHO used to use. So I agree 100%. All right, thanks. They were, I just got a, also got a question uh, asking if you could repeat their website. And, and for anyone who has asked, we will be uh, posting these uh, presentations. Um, we, we may send them by email, but they'll definitely be posted on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network, which you can find at ken.cafc.org. And if you just search for ICF for webinar, et cetera, it's in the Child Development and Rehabilitation section. You'll definitely be able to find it there. But we will very likely send uh, a message by, uh, by email to all of the participants after this, letting you know the links or, or even attaching the presentations. But, Kevin, if you could just repeat your website one more time. Sure. It's udsmr.org. So like Thanks. the Uniform Data System medical, of Medical Rehabilitation. You're welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, this next question is uh, probably for Shan uh, Sandy uh, or Shauna. Um, and they asked, is the WeFIM presentation here just to give an example of how to use the ICF and outcome measurement, or is since they're looking at using the WeFIM or items as a national uh, health indicator? That, um, that is a good question. The uh, intention here was to demonstrate uh, really an example of an outcome measure and, uh, and how it might be fit into an ICF framework. Um, we really are not at a point where we've come to any decisions about which outcome measures are going to be included in the um, national minimum data set. <clears throat> and there's still a lot of work to be done to come to that point. Uh, it, because the WeFIM people had done the crosswalk of their uh, instrument uh, to the ICF, and because there was a significant number of uh, member organizations who currently use the uh, WeFIM, uh, we thought that this would be a good illustration, a good demonstration. Donna, any comment? Uh, no, I think you captured it well, Sandy. Um, my own my comment would be, and it might be a question, a comment and question for uh, Joanna, is that look, trying to find outcome measurements that fit within the categories of impairment, activity, and participation are challenging, um, particularly on the um, dimensions where families. Have, as you so eloquently indicated, um, really look at the true value of our uh, interventions, and that's within the participation realm. Um, and I think the, it's interesting to look at the difference in the data, whereas administrators at first blush will say that, oh, well, yes, our um, facilities are using participation measures, but when you actually dig down into the data where therapists are setting goals, uh, there are very few participation goals that are actually set. And then how do you go about measuring those goals? So I, there is a lot of work to be done uh, within this field, and uh, you may have some further comments on that, Joanna. You had talked about um, uh, a cerebral palsy group or a consortium looking at outcome measures for cerebral palsy and in particular participation. Uh, yes, it's Joanna. Shawna, you're absolutely right. One of the challenges is that when we actually look at the outcome measures that we use, we have, the majority of them actually are kind of identifying or evaluating body function and structure rather than activities right. and participation. I think it will change drastically in the next five to ten years. My guess is that there will be a plethora of new measures that measure activity and participation. It's hard to tell what comes first, if we're measuring um, impairment because there's few measures or because that's where we were in our clinical practice and we're now much more aware of the importance of, of looking at activity and participation. Currently, I think if therapists are very interested in capturing activity and participation, they will often use a broad-based measure like uh, the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure or Goal Attainment Scaling so they can actually try and capture family goals. And then our job would be to kind of classify them and to see at what component of the ICF family goals are 
So I think it will happen concurrently. Our interest in activity and participation will increase, and the measures in that area will also increase. Of course, CanChild at McMaster has been very influential in uh, test development in Canada, and they've developed the CAPE, which is a measure of participation. And I know that Mary Law with Wendy Costner in the States is currently developing a new measure of participation for children. So I think it, w it, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, <coughs> thanks, Joanna. Um, the, here's a question um, for Joanna, I believe. Uh, they're asking, Joanna, how would clinicians actually use the codes as they set goals and talk with families? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, my sense right now is in, in pediatric rehabilitation, where we are in our use of the ICF is in using the framework, the terminology. I know of very few centers that are actually using the coding system of the ICF, and I have a lot of colleagues in different countries, and many people are, are not using the coding system yet. The coding system itself is a bit laborious, you know, and, and I think it's like anything. You just have to get used to it. But um, I'm not sure if we'll ever get to the point. We may, especially if um, it was a top-down administrative decision that we would use the coding system of the ICF, then I think that we would all get used to using it. But it's not um, user-friendly right now. It's, it's, there's a lot of levels, and, and as you just saw in the presentation, a lot of numbers. What some people are doing in research is picking one item of the ICF and using that as their outcome measure, so a mobility one item, for example. And I have a few concerns about that because I'm not sure it's specific enough to really identify the complete change that you may see in a child. So I think there's a lot of work to be done on how to actually use the ICF codes as an outcome measure rather than as a data management system. I'm, I'm not sure that the ICF actually envisioned or the World Health Organization actually envisioned that one item would be used as an outcome measure. And when I was in Sweden, I saw a couple of groups that were doing that. So I think, again, we're on the frontier of how to use the codes. But uh, don't feel that you're behind if you're not coding on the ICF, because I would suggest that most um, rehab centers are not yet doing that. We do code on the ICD-10, which is the companion measure with the ICF, so we may get to be coding the ICF, but I don't think it's happening, happening currently. Mm -hmm. I, I just have one comment about that. Um, uh, when we were at a, um, a meeting with the um, Canadian Institute of Health Information, the point that about um, uh, the ICF uh, in PDI or in rehab, and the point was made a number of times that the um, ICF is not uh, designed to be used as a, a measure. Uh, it's designed to be used as a classification system, and I think that that you know people kind of make that association and um, and the point was made that that needs those need to be kept quite separate. Um, the, uh, also there, there was a presentation from Manitoba, I believe, I'm not sure whether anyone from Manitoba is on this call, um, that they've been doing a lot of work between the health system and the education system uh, to come to some agreement about uh, common language uh, using the ICF uh, in order to identify um, resource needs for children um, uh, in the health system and in schools. So uh, some really, really interesting work to come to some common agreement between those two sectors that our kids go back and forth between to be able to uh, communicate with one another about a child's uh, functioning and, uh, and their need for resources. And they're actually doing that, working that into a funding model, I believe. It's Joanna. Um, Sandy, you're absolutely right, and, and that's what I was trying to say, is that the, the World Health Organization did not develop the ICF as an outcome measure. But some people are starting to use it in that way. And my example from Sweden is they're using one item and using it as a before-after indicator of improvement. All right, thank you. Um, here's another uh, uh, comment, I guess. This one's directed at Kevin and Joelle, and, um, and it says, Hi, Kevin and Joelle. Um, we, as in myself and collaborator, collaborators at the ICF Research Branch of the World Health Organization, have developed an updated version of crosswalking guidelines between outcome instruments for children and the ICF. 
I think our guidelines would enhance and supplement the crosswalking the way you have already done it. Uh, the publication for public use is still six months away because we are in testing phase, but if you're interested in learning about it, and she's given some contact information, so I'll, I'll pass that along to you, and, uh, and perhaps there will be a, some, some useful uh, collaboration there. Thank you, Doug. Yes, very much so. We would love to see this, her contact information. Um, we also had a comment here. It said, at the beginning, uh, there was mention of uh, child and youth rehab centers across Canada. Uh, does this include children's treatment centers or... Uh, inpatient rehabilitation centers or both. Um, I'm not, she didn't, she, uh, the question doesn't specify at, at what point the, the, the child and youth rehab centers were, were mentioned. Uh, my suspicion, if we're talking about uh, sensors activities, we always consider both the in, inpatient rehab centers as well as uh, outpatient and children's, outpatient rehab centers and children's treatment centers. But as far as applying the ICF and any of the work that we're doing in this committee, uh, Sandy, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, when we did our survey, 72% um, of the uh, respondents were from outpatient rehab, 56% uh, child development centers, 28% inpatient rehab, and 22% uh, were inpatient rehab that was part that were part of the Children's Acute Care Hospital. So yes, it just it did span the uh, spectrum of uh, inpatient, outpatient, different types of uh, organizations. Thanks. Um, somebody asked a question. Uh, I have not heard the term crosswalk used in this way. Uh, can you ex please explain it a little bit further? I'm not sure if they're referring to Kevin and Joelle's presentation specifically or... Um, we, I, I, I guess we use the word crosswalk in mapping um, kind of together. I guess we could use the word mapping instead of crosswalk or crosswalk instead of mapping. It just merely, it just merely means we've taken our tool and matched it up to, you know, the ICF descriptors. Um, I'm not sure I can add a whole lot more to that. Yeah, I think that's the typical way that, that, I, that I would have understood it is uh, in that it's, it's, it's taking the data points from one system and, and finding where they're common in another system. But uh, um, so I, I think you've explained it well. Uh, we also had a comment here about, um, it says, as a disability childhood researcher, I like your comment about uh, trying to find outcomes about participation. I uh, should like to point out for program administrators that uh, her research shows that rehabilitation and interventions are picked up quite well by participation and uh, quality of life type instruments. Mm -hmm. any, any comment about that? Um, it's Joanna. I could just make a, a quick comment about quality of life instruments. There's some, there's some differences about how people code them or classify them in the ICS. Some people want to put all quality of life instruments as a, in the component of activity and participation. But when you look at quality of life instruments, especially health-related quality of life instruments, oftentimes they're um, assessing things like pain, sleep, um, and actually they are coded by body function and structure. So what some people um, suggest that for quality of life instruments or other instruments that you look at the items and decide where is the where did the majority of items where are they classified under which component of the ICF and then put the uh, the measure there rather than saying that all quality of life instruments reflect participation I think it's dangerous to assume that mm -hmm. I'm done all right thanks <laughs> Um, that's, uh, does anyone else have any questions? That's the last question that has, has been submitted so far. And, and, and while we're giving people uh, any, another opportunity to type in some questions, does anyone else on the panel have any, any other comments they'd like to add at this point? We do have about, about 10 minutes left in the presentation, so there is some time. Mm -hmm. I think our goal to try and develop a national minimum data set for pediatric children's well, for pediatric rehabilitation is uh, an enormous uh, task. Um, you know, perhaps our sector, there are, there are gaps in our sector as far as, uh, as getting some outcome measurements. But um, uh, in our group, we're trying very hard. We have a very dedicated group from across the country 
who are putting their minds together to look at some ways to start to measure uh, some indicators for us. Uh, we are using the MPOC, uh, the Measures of Processes Care, looking at family satisfaction, and we've rolled that out across uh, five sites across the, the country. And uh, we're starting to get some data and look at that to see how we compare with one another. Um, we have a small group that's working on wait times, and wait times is a huge initiative across the country and has a lot of political um, spotlighting uh, with our funders. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a daunting task for our group. And we would welcome anybody who would like to join our group in trying to move this initiative forward. So if you have an interest in becoming a member, um, if you could uh, let us know. Um, Doug, could we give uh, your contact through the sensor? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. If anybody has any questions uh, that they, or anything that they would like me to pass on to any of the presenters or anything, absolutely. Um, you can contact uh, me at any time by email at D Maynard at CAFC.org. That's D M A Y N A R D at C A P H C dot org. Um, or, the, of course, the phone number is 613 738 4164. And all that information will be available on our web website as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, we definitely do see this as a journey. We haven't landed on um, uh, specific indicators as yet, and there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so, we're very pleased to be able to host today, get some of your questions, um, your feedback on some of the work that we've done to date, and to hear what other people are doing across the country. So I, if there are no questions that have come forward, I do have any more questions come forward, Doug? Uh, someone has asked uh, if we could provide information for the group in Sweden that is using the ICF as an outcome measure. Would, um, uh, uh, yeah, it, I, it was just a, a rehabilitation center, and there was a researcher there that was doing it. So it's not a formalized Swedish group, but um, they are doing some re funded research in that area. Do they have any present, uh, publications, Joanna? Uh, no, she doesn't at, the point, at this point. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I'm, I'm not convinced that that is the direction that we should be going, but... Yeah. I can actually I can find that out. I can uh, find the woman's name out, and uh, Doug, maybe I'll give it to you. Yeah, if you send it to me again, I'll, I'll we'll post that information on the Knowledge Exchange Network as okay. well, along with all sure. of the publications and stuff. Sure. So to that end, I just want to give my sincere thank you to Joanna, Kevin, and Joelle for their participation in this webinar. Sandy and I are very appreciative of the information that you bring and the richness that you bring to our discussions. Um, and uh, to thank the uh, audience for linking in and your strong, your enthusiastic, enthusiastic interest in this topic, and uh, and in sensor. So um, we will keep you posted on our work, and hopefully our paths will cross again at another uh, session. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Sandy? No, just again, any uh, one who wants to follow up and uh, link in with us and be part of um, uh, this uh, work, it, which is very exciting work. And I think the number of participants here uh, demonstrates the uh, interest that people are showing in this uh, area and is very promising. So again, if uh, you are interested in continuing to, in following up and, and working with us on this, please contact Doug, and um, you know, we're looking for clinicians, researchers, administrators, uh, and um, uh, people who can help to move, this, move us ahead in this journey. So contact Doug, and you'll be welcome. All right. Thank you, uh, Sandy and Shauna, for, uh, for hosting this session and for all the work that you've done in pulling all of these experts and all of this information together. Uh, I think from the numbers we have attending, there is a lot of interest in the ICF and in the overall topic of determining and measuring health outcomes for this population. We had a lot of great questions and discussion. And if you'd like more information about this and other related topics, please, again, check out the Child Development and Rehabilitation section of the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network at www.ken.com. 
There you'll find the PowerPoint presentations that were just presented here, as well as a forum for posting further questions and discussions about this and other topics. You'll also find information on a variety of topics such as patient safety, children's pain, and much, much more. If you, if you have any questions or would like to contact CAFC or CINSER at any time, please don't hesitate to drop me an email at dmaynard at cafc.org. Thank you again for attending, and we hope you will be able to join us for our next installment in the CAFC webinar and podcast series.